Thanks for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Welcome back to segment two of Uncle Sam's American Soccer Podcast, Christian Pulisic special. If you haven't listened to segment one, go ahead, rewind, go back. We spoke with Brandon Busby of London is Blue Podcast to discuss the Chelsea impact on the Pulisic transfer. You can follow the pod at Uncle Sam's Soccer Pod. You can follow me, Armand Kafai, at Armand Kafai. You can follow Jake from Minnesota at Jake Retrobe. You can follow our producer, Stephen Jodderin, at Stephen Jodderin. But let's get to this part episode of the show where we talk about solidarity payments. All right, listeners, we're going to get right into it. Joining us on the line is Brian Costin. He has a public policy and economics background. He has aided in U.S. soccer governments. Oh, you can follow him on Twitter at Brian Costin. Brian, thank you so much for taking your Sunday afternoon and joining us here today. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you so much for having me. Brian, let's dive right in uh, into the discussion on solidarity payments. It seems like they've been in the news recently with the transfer of Christian Pulisic uh, from Borussia Dortmund to Chelsea. Can you tell our listeners exactly how do solidarity payments work? Sure. Um, solidarity payments are a regulation from FIFA, uh, the Global Soccer Governance Organization, and uh, with their mission to promote the game of football, protect its integrity, and bring the game to all, they've de- developed a system called solidarity payments, uh, as, well, as well as training compensation, which is a separate issue but similar issue. But solidarity payments to incentivize youth training for soccer. So there's a lot of people um, around the world that FIFA wants to get into the game of soccer, and they believe that this is a method that will help train the next generation of players that we might see in the Premier League uh, one day or one of the other leagues around the world. And so in the case of Christian Pulisic, of course, we've heard in the news that there's a transfer between Borussia Dortmund and Chelsea for $71 million. And this triggers, uh, because it is a transfer between Germany and England, that's the key trigger, Uh, It's between two different countries. Um, It triggers solidarity payments. And solidarity payments uh, takes up to 5% of that fee and and uses it towards compensation, the solidarity compensation, to incentivize that youth training. Um, So we're talking about approximately, um, uh, in this case, for the um, the club that, that Christian Pulisic um, was in, the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm pulling up right here, PA Classics, um, they would be entitled in this case, if U.S. soccer was a participant in this system, between uh, $548,000 um, uh, and in, in some people believe up to a million dollars in solidarity payments. And they can use that to then give kids scholarships to be a part of their training, be a part of their U.S. Development Academy at PA Classics. So it's, it's a huge sum of money, and it's really a, a groundbreaking thing if it were to happen. The problem is in the United States is that for quite some time, U.S. soccer has had the position that solidarity payments are unenforceable in the United States. And that is currently being contested uh, before FIFA Uh, with the DeAndre Yedlin at Tottenham Hotspurs case. Uh, He was a a member of a club called Crossfire Premier prior to being at the Seattle Sounders. Uh, He was transferred a few years back to Tottenham for $4 million. And since then, Crossfire Premier has been forwarding a case to get what they believe that they are entitled to underneath the global rules of football underneath FIFA. Um, That is currently in dispute. We might get a resolution on that any day. But but if we do, what does it mean for the United States? It can be a groundbreaking moment. Um, This is very closely attached to the pay-to-play phenomenon in the United States where soccer players, when they're kids, their parents have to pay lots of money 
to be able to get trained at a high level. And this is a potential game changer, which would begin to allow a different system in the United States that would, would help give, in this case, hundreds of kids the opportunity to play soccer at a, at a very high youth level. And one day, this could be something that's happening all over the country and helping kids um, all over the country getting a good soccer education and becoming uh, the next generation of soccer players that might be playing professionally in the United States and around the world. That was a very detailed explanation from Brian. Brian, uh, you mentioned how U.S. soccer and, uh, has contested uh, solidarity payments uh, for many years. Uh what are the reasons behind why U.S. soccer uh, is choosing not to uh, involve itself in uh, solidarity payments? So many years ago, there was a case called Frazier versus MLS, and it was an antitrust case. Um, essentially, there was players that in the MLS Players Union filed a law suit against MLS saying that there was all sorts of restrictive antitrust behavior that was happening between MLS and its players. Uh, and a party to that lawsuit was U.S. soccer. And over time, uh, U.S. soccer and the, the MLS Players Union decided to come to a sort of side agreement to allow, allow them to exit the, the, uh, the case. And uh, what ended up happening is that U.S. Soccer agreed not to play a part in collecting solidarity payments in the United States. So U.S. soccer being the governing body underneath FIFA it is ostensibly responsible for helping facilitate those payments. So there was no court case um, that actually triggered this. There was no ruling by a judge. Um, there's no sense one way or another if this would be legal or illegal because it was never decided before a judge. But this was an agreement between the MLS Players Union and U.S. soccer to get out of that lawsuit. And ever since then, U.S. soccer has tried to block solidarity payments from happening in the United States. Maybe you had answered this, and I know you, you, there's so much information that you're throwing at us, but what is the big reason for not having solidarity payments? What are the people saying? What is, I guess, the argument for keeping the system as is versus introducing solidarity payments and going that method? Well, I, I think we can start with the MLS Players Union because this is where the issue started in the United States. They were the ones that first had the objection to it. It's kind of curious. You have a players union who has decided that they're going to take the position that they want to restrict their employers, whether it be a club or MLS, uh, from making solidarity payments to youth soccer clubs. And so you have a players union who's saying, we don't want our, our employers to invest in soccer. We don't want to invest in player training. And their argument, one of their arguments is, is um, that it creates an inhibition of free movement of players. Their economic argument is that even though What's the global standard, and they do this everywhere else in the world. If we have that here, it will lower the chances of a player in the United States transferring to, say, Europe. Um, I disagree with that. They're, they're saying that we're prohibiting the movement of player or kind of restricting the movement of players for what? To play in other FIFA-sanctioned competitions. Okay, so if you want to play in a FIFA, FIFA sanctioned composition competition. My argument is you should play according to the rules of FIFA. Now, Major League Soccer, and in, in essence, the, the the players union is underneath MLS. They have agreed when they got sanctioning from U.S. Soccer, and U.S. Soccer is, is sanctioned by FIFA. They basically said we're going to play by the rules so that we can get sanctioned by U.S. soccer and FIFA. Now they're saying that they selectively don't want to uh, have the rules of FIFA apply to them, even though they want their players to have the opportunity to go play in other FIFA competitions in other nations where solidarity payments are the norm. And so to get to the bottom line, here's why I think solidarity payments should be the policy. It's voluntary. This is a policy that FIFA and the global sport of football have decided that this is a good thing. 
the word solidarity. We're in this together. We're going to say, if you're going to spend $71 million, that you take 5% of it. Or in this case, it would be 171th of the $71 million that Chelsea is paying Borussia Dortmund to spend that on new soccer. And so this is, this is a legacy for Christian Pulisic. This transfer can help hundreds, and I've calculated the numbers, it can, at the uh, the amount of money you have to pay f- to be on, on the development academy at uh, PA Classics, you can educate 500 kids, 500, more than 500 scholarships can come from this money through solidarity payments. And that's a lot of opportunities for a lot of kids that might not otherwise be able to, maybe they wouldn't even be able to play any organized soccer. And so I think it's really a huge missed opportunity if MLS Players Union, U.S. Soccer, and others continue to block what is a voluntary global arrangement in the competition that they've agreed to play in. Um, So I think it's absolutely something that needs to be done. It's not going to fix pay-to-play overnight, but what it's going to do one kid at a time is going to give more kids an opportunity to play the game of soccer. There's benefits way beyond the game of soccer when you get kids in organized activities health improves their school it gives them better future in many different ways and it's 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 really sad that uh, mls players union u.s soccer and others have said we're not going to participate in the system in fact we're going to block you from participating in the system and one curious note is that the original deandre yedlin tottenham case Tottenham was ready to make the payment directly to Crossfire Premier in Washington. And U.S. Soccer stepped in and said, no, 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 you can't do this. Don't make the payment. Instead, make the payment directly to MLS. So MLS is benefiting from it in some aspects. In this case, with Christian Pulisic, it's outside of MLS. It Christian Pulisic was never in an MLS academy, but still, uh, it is believed, even though U.S. soccer has been a little bit quieter on the issue as the final resolution of this case uh, might be in a couple weeks, we might find out about it, um, their position has always been to block it. So we're at a really interesting moment. Now the stakes are so much higher because this is by far the biggest transfer that has ever come from someone that was trained at the youth level in the United States. So this is a really big deal. And in terms of that, uh, that cross, that crossfire case, and those really, uh, publicized, is there any feeling which, uh, which way the case is going to go, uh, in favor of us or in favor of crossfire or, or not? I think that there's a really good chance that there is a favorable outcome to crossfire. And and one of the reasons why, well, the facts of the case are very, very strong in my opinion. This this is a FIFA rule. U.S. soccer has agreed to be a part of FIFA and Major League Soccer has agreed to be a part of FIFA. So you would think that they would all follow the rules that they've agreed to follow. So the facts in that regard lead me to believe that Um, there's a strong possibility of a positive outcome. The other factors, Major League Soccer, Don Garber, if you remember about six months ago, Alfonso Davies from the Vancouver Whitecaps got transferred to um, Bayern Munich for about $15 million, I believe. MLS has kind of changed their tune on solidarity payments. In that case, because Vancouver is in Canada and it's a little bit different, the little bit different question of whether or not that there is an issue there, the Vancouver actually did make a solidarity payment to two of Afonso Davies' youth club. So, and Don Garber has come out and said, if we, if the case comes back that we have to make solidarity payments or solidarity payments are valid in the United States then um, we're okay with that. We think we're going to be a winner in that. And also, I would note, so Don Garber has kind of changed his tune in regards to MLS participating in solidarity payments. Um, The other thing is, is that MLS is spending a lot of money 
on their youth academies now. So the economics are that they've been pouring in tens of millions of dollars into the youth academies. And some of those players have gotten signed by Europe before they got signed by MLS. And so MLS gets nothing underneath the current arrangement. So I believe that as they've made more investments in MLS academies and they've seen a lot of their players go overseas for free, uh, it makes it more likely that MLS will be in support of solidarity payments and training compensation. So I think that that's a good positive development there. The other last thing I would say is that Carlos Cordero, the new U.S. soccer president, has not been a big of thorn in the side of, of solidarity payments as Suno Galati was. Suno Galati was rumored to have asked FIFA to delay the resolution of the DeAndre Yedlin case and did not want there to be a resolution so that we would be in this limbo forever where solidarity payments wouldn't be paid. From outwards appearances, it doesn't appear that Carlos Cordero is making that kind of interference at FIFA anymore. So I think we have a really good shot to get a positive resolution on this voluntary beneficial policy between FIFA, U.S. soccer, and the clubs within the United States to make solidarity payments legal. And I think that that would be a fantastic thing for youth soccer in America. Brian, I wanted to ask you about uh, PA Classics and the, uh, I believe he was the Academy, uh, Academy Director, uh, Steve Klein. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was quoted in the, in the Jeff Carlisle piece a few days ago on ESPN.com, where he essentially said, I, I don't want to accept any, solid, any solidarity payments for the Christian Pulisic transfer. I think he, his reasoning was, you know, I don't want to benefit from Christian Pulisic's uh, success and, you know, the, 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 the cost of the lawyer fees to uh, secure that money. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I, I think it's it's very interesting. I'm a little bit disappointed that that PA Classics has decided to take um, that position. Maybe it's not a final position, but I think so. When you say something like PA Classics is a blended pay-to-play club, and they also have some scholarships. In, in this case, it appears that Christian was a pay-to-play uh, a student, um, so to speak. And so the thinking that that would somehow change the FIFA regulation, I don't agree with that. The FIFA regulation does not make any mention of whether uh, an individual player was a uh, pay-to-play player or if they were a scholarship player. It's regardless. And I think it's also, you know, one of the things that, that was said by the representatives of PA Classic was that, you know, this isn't going to solve the problem anyways. Uh, It's not going to cure pay to play um, in its entirety. But, you know, so what? When you're talking about Christian Pulisic, I mean, if you want to make a change in in American soccer, it's one kid at a time. And, And this single case has the potential to change hundreds of kids' lives and give them the opportunity to play soccer that they might not ever have had. And so I think that's a a big mistake. Now, as far as the legal fees and and trying to go after the money, um, that's that's, that's a valid concern. Uh, I would recommend to them, maybe they should wait to see what the resolution of the DeAndre Yedlin case is. Maybe make an inquiry to FIFA and say, hey, I just thought you should let you know we have this big uh, transfer fee here and, and it might apply to us in regards to solidarity payment. But I would really question, like, if you were a board member of PA Classics or if you were a parent who had a child and you were paying a lot of money to send there and you were struggling to make sacrifices in your life um, in order to put your kid there and then you find out that they're they're passing up a half a million to a million dollars that they could have gotten, um, that, is, that, is, that is a hard sell. Uh, for me as a board member or me as a parent of, of a kid that's on that club. No, uh, I mean, you, you raise an excellent point there. Brian, I, we want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to speaking to us. I want to give you the opportunity to go ahead and plug yourself and, and if you want to plug anything else. Well, you know, thank you for having me on your show. I, I, um, I, I think it's great that there are people now with the Christian 
Christian Pulisic transfer, it's it's now become a bigger issue. So I think more people are getting ed- educated about that. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, one of my personal th- for for 2019 is I am looking to start a soccer policy nonprofit. I'm here in, in Chicago, uh, really close to U.S. soccer, and I want to help the the game of soccer in the United States. So if you're interested in something like that, you can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, it's, it's Brian, B R I A N Costin C O S T I N. And that's my handle at Twitter. And thanks again for having me on the show. Wow, what insight there. Uh, Armand and Jake, solidary payments. How do, how do we feel on the issue? What, what what should U.S. soccer, what should the public want here? Well, I mean, the MLSPA, it's, it's a really interesting stance. I mean, I was thinking about it during the interview with Brian. Um, they say the, that, you know, they're restricting player movement by having these payments. But, I mean, I might be wrong by saying this. They're the same PA that accepted a really bad free agency and didn't have their players move for a very long time. Their free agency is what? You have like 10 years of MLS experience and be over to age of 30? Like, and that's good? And that's not restricting uh, freedom of movement? So I think that's a pretty bogus argument. But I like what Brian said. It's not going to end pay to play. It's going to help it. And that's a positive first step. But the fact of the matter is, I still... I, I'm kind of conflicted because I know that there are some academy directors that make six figures. And, you know, will all that money go to covering scholarships for players? Or will it also go to uh, coaches and other administrative things as well? And they'll just keep the prices or maybe subsidize it a little bit and make it maybe more affordable. I mean, there I, there's a lot of things. I, I think soccer in America is a little bit more greedy um, uh, than a lot of people want to think. And it will help. But I'm not sure if it'll help tremendously but i think it'll be a positive step I mean, that's just me i'm a pessimist though well Stop. we all know i'm mr negative in this podcast oh. Armand. and while yes in principle i think you know you 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 take the uh, academies get these solidarity payments you know and maybe they cut down on the cost what it you know of you know for a player to enroll in the academy or you increase the scholarships or whatever however the, the pessimist in me also thinks that what if these academy directors and these higher ups within the academy are just taking money from these solid solidarity payments and keeping them for themselves and not dishing them out to help players uh, with you know pay to play and, and things like that? I mean, I mean, not even, not even that, Jake. I mean, think about it. not all that money is going to go towards scholarships. I mean, maybe for many of these teams, you you want to upgrade facilities. With the money you get, you can maybe upgrade your facility. Um, and yes, well, like I said, it's it's a step in the right direction uh, to invest in the youth. I I think it's much more different. A lot of people think I mean, these, these teams are what they're getting what three, four thousand dollars a year from kids to play soccer. Um, it's a that's lot. A, that's a lot. <laughs> like it's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, my my expect my guess, my guess, and this is me just from what I've heard around youth soccer and whatnot, and my friends playing growing up. My guess is it would be around, you know, maybe the cost of drops like one to two thousand a year instead of being at three, four thousand. I don't know. Hey, I, I mean, a right. cut's a cut, than, right? Yeah, I mean, a cut's a cut, exactly. So it's a step in the right direction. But I think people who are saying it's going to eliminate pay to play are very misinformed. Oh, I, I think so. Uh, Jake, last thought. No, it'll be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out. Like, you know, we have the. Uh, the pending lawsuit with uh, DeAndre Yedlin and the uh, I can't think of the Crossfire his Academy Cross. Thank you with uh, his Academy in Washington Crossfire versus uh, U.S. Soccer. That that case will I believe there's supposed to be ruling on that case any day now. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out and how that it'll, it'll affect solid solid. I can't say solidarity solidarity payments going forward. So. Anyway, listeners, come back tomorrow for the final segment. Kind of give you our our entire thoughts. What's the marketing ploy from Chelsea in U.S. soccer? Well, Chelsea suddenly be America's most popular Premier League team. If you're waiting for the full episode, I'll drop Friday. Talk to you tomorrow.